This slide we're going to look at the single state and the two state uh, solutions for the gas laws. The uh, single state is the one that we'll use in the course. There is a tutorial dealing with the uh, two state, and if you do that, you actually get double points. So you can try it. Let's talk about bonding again. We dealt with molecular compounds. We said that molecular compounds have a covalent bond between the atoms, and they share electrons. We also dealt with ionic compounds. Ionic compounds don't share at all. In fact, one electron leaves one atom and goes to the other. Turns out that these are two limits of the way bonding really is. Most covalent bonding is somewhere in between chlorine and a full ionic compound. Let's look at a couple examples. Let's look at hydrogen, molecular hydrogen, and compare this with hydrogen fluoride. Now, these are ball and stick models of the two. Hydrogen is simply diatomic. It's two hydrogens stuck together. What we're going to do is look at what's called an electrostatic potential map. Now, an electrostatic potential map is kind of neat because it allows you to look at the electron distribution in a molecule. Let's start off with hydrogen. For molecular hydrogen, in order to calculate an electrostatic potential mass, and this is something that computers do these days, um, what you do is you pretty much figure out where the electrons are around this molecule. So we do this calculation, and we wind up with a shape of some sort with our molecule in the middle. Next, the computer gives it a color. Now, the color represents the, basically the electron distribution and the changes in distribution as you go across the map. So for hydrogen, when we color it, we get something like this. A really nice little green Easter array. The fact that it's pretty much uniformly green, top to bottom, side to side, means that we have really nice, even electron distribution. And this is kind of what you expect, because the two hydrogens are identical. You would expect them to share perfectly. And they pretty much do. Now let's contrast this with hydrogen fluoride. Hydrogen fluoride. These are different atoms. When we calculate the electrostatic potential map for these guys, it turns out to be much, much different. In fact, it looks something like this. Again, it's an Easter egg sort of thing, except it is delightfully colored. Now, with an electrostatic potential map, blue represents a deficiency of electrons. Red represents lots of electrons. So what's happening is in this covalent bond here, the fluorine is sucking all the electrons away from the hydrogen towards itself. So it's not sharing very well, is it? Not like hydrogen did. This is what's called a polar covalent bond. Whenever you have two different atoms in a covalent bond, it will almost always be polar. Now, a polar covalent bond generally will form what's called a dipole. Dipole we show as an arrow with a cross on one end. Where it's crossed, this is the positive end. 
It goes in the direction of our covalent bond here. And the uh, arrow here is the negative end. And when you see a dipole, that tells you that the covalent bond is polarized with less electrons at this end and more at this end. Now, why does this happen? Well, this happens because of something called electronegativity. Electronegativity is simply one of the inherent properties of an atom. It basically says how strongly that particular atom attracts electrons to itself. The scale starts down here. Francium is the lowest at 0.7. Fluorine is the most at just about 4. The bond between hydrogen and fluorine, we have 2.2 and 4. That's a very polar covalent bond. So without really having to understand the dynamics or whatever of electronegativity, if you have a more electronegative atom, it will draw electrons towards itself. That's the bottom line. Any question on the concept? All right, let's go and look at water. We're dealing with solutions here. When we deal with solutions, we're talking about water. Let's start off with a Lewis structure. Now, we did these in lab the other day. Go ahead and draw the Lewis structure from water. I know you can all do this. Start with oxygen. It's here in group six. So how many valence electrons does it have? Group six, it has six. <coughs> We arrange these around the oxygen this way, because remember, the first four go in singly, and then we start to pair them. Hydrogen is here in group one, so it has one valence electron. <coughs> we have two hydrogens. We know that we need two electrons to form the bond. So logically, I'm going to put one hydrogen here, one here, So we can use these to form covalent bonds. When we do this, this is our Lewis structure for water. Now let's just check our octet rule here. Oxygen is in the middle here. It has two, four, six, eight electrons around it. That's a full octet. Hydrogen, because it's in the first period, can only accommodate two electrons, and each hydrogen is sharing two. So this is a good structure. Now, a while ago, we talked about molecular shapes. If you look at water, it has four things around it. Remember the valence shell, <coughs> uh, uh, electron repulsion theory said that these electrons are going to get as far apart from each other as they can. And in water, this generates a structure that looks like this. We have our oxygen, here's our two hydrogens, and here's our two unshared pairs. These are tetrahedral. Now, we can't see that it's tetrahedral because you can't see the electrons. But what we see is that this goes in and out like that, and that's called bent. The tetrahedron is there. Here's our tetrahedron. <coughs> Again, <coughs> lone pairs out here. 
two hydrogens, and the oxygen in the middle. All right, so we have big geometry. Now, oxygen and hydrogen are going to have different electronegativities, just like hydrogen and fluorine did. For these two, hydrogen is about 2.1, and oxygen is about 3.5. So that means that the electrons in this covalent bond here are going to be drawn towards the oxygen. The oxygen is going to suck them towards itself. So we're going to have one little dipole here and one dipole here. Now because the molecule is bent and not linear, because it's bent, this means that we get a molecular dipole. That is, this end of the molecule will be positive, and this end will be negative. The molecular dipole will look like this. Positive end down here, negative end up here by the oxygen. So let's compare this to the electrostatic potential map for water. Once again, here's our oxygen, big red splotch, lots of electrons. Down here where our two little hydrogens are, we see blue. That's because the oxygen is sucking the electrons towards itself. The bottom line here is that oxygen is a very polar molecule. Because it's polar, this is the property that allows oxygen to do stuff like dissolve ionic solids. Remember, if we take an ionic compound, we can place this in water, it will dissolve, and it will form ions. We just did conductivity. Those were ions in water solution. Let's look, that again, the thing that allows this is the fact that we have this molecular dipole in water. So let's look at a simple video here that describes the formation of a solution. Here's a little block of sodium chloride. The sodiums are the little silver things, they're the metal. The chlorines are the uh, green guys, and they all have a negative charge. The uh, sodiums all have a positive charge. Now when I start the movie here, what's going to happen is, in an animated way, we're going to have waters come in, and they're going to start removing ions from the crystal. Here we go. Pay attention to exactly how this happens. You see we're pulling off sodiums, we're pulling off chlorines, waters come in here, bunches at a time, yank them off, and away they go. Now I hope you will pay attention because the process by which this happened wasn't random. As the waters came in and pulled off these charged particles, the waters were oriented in a certain way. <clears throat> Here's a clip. Here's our chlorine. If you happen to notice, Whenever the water molecules ripped off a chloride anion, the waters were oriented this way, with the hydrogens facing the anion. Now, why was that? Because the anion is negative, and we're going to wrap it as much as we can 
with the positive ends of our waters. Over here for sodium. Sodium is anionic, it's positive. If you look, all of the waters around it have the oxygens pointing at the sodium. That's because the negative end here interacts with the positive ion. The reason that water can dissolve something like sodium chloride is that it has this positive end and this negative end. And these can interact individually with these ions. Now when it interacts, it doesn't just, you know, like point at it or something. It actually has a great effect on the ion in solution. <clears throat> this represents a, so a sodium cation. It's blue. Electrostatic potential map for cation is going to be very blue. What I've done is I've put three water molecules around it. And what I'm going to do is simply calculate a new electrostatic potential map for sodium in the middle, three waters around it. Now we've seen what the water looks like, you know, positive end, negative end. This is what the sodium looks like, big blue ball. When you do the whole process, what you get is something like this. The amazing thing here is that the big blue ball is gone. Now the big blue ball is still there. It's in the middle, here's our waters. But the waters have, because of their dipole, they've been able to take this positive charge and disperse it over this entire complex. Now this calculation was done with three waters. Typically something like a sodium ion would be surrounded by at least eight. So the effect is so much, much more than we've shown here. The reason that this works, the reason that water is essential to everything we know about life on Earth and everywhere else, is that it is dipolar, and it can interact with ions like this, stabilize them, spread out the charge. The more you spread it out, the more stable it is, and allow these things to go into solution. That's the magic of water. Water is the only substance on Earth that can do this. Oh, ammonia can do it somewhat. Alcohols can do it somewhat. But nobody comes anywhere close to water. Water is amazing. Any questions? All right, well, we got this stuff in solution. Let's talk a little bit about solution. If something dissolves in a liquid, we say it's soluble. <clears throat> the term of solubility gives us the maximum amount of a substance that you can dissolve in a given volume. So if something is like magnesium carbonate, if we had one liter of water, we can dissolve a little over half a gram of magnesium carbonate. So we say its solubility is 0.53 grams per liter. That's all solubility means. Now, if you have magnesium carbonate, you have a liter of it, and you have 0.53 grams dissolved in it, this solution is said to be saturated. So that's the most you can get in, is if it's saturated. If you had any more, it would just sit on the bottom. Would not go in solution. 
solvent, by definition, is the thing that does the dissolving, and solute is the stuff that you dissolve. So those are just terms you need to know. Any questions on the concept? Well, I lied here just a little bit. Nobody caught me. When I say a solution is saturated, that does mean that that's the most you can get in, usually. Sometimes you can make a solution that's called super saturated, like supersized. Okay. That means you have more in solution than you're supposed to. Now, these are very delicate solutions, usually. And almost anything you do to them is going to make it drop from super saturated back to what it's supposed to be. But here's a really neat example. This is a solution of sodium acetate, that's a salt, in water. Um, this is super saturated. So there's more in here than there's supposed to be. Now when I click my magic button here, somebody is going to drop one crystal, that's it, just one crystal, down the mouth of this flask, and it's going to hit the solution. So let's watch and see what happens. This is just stable, sitting here like this, as long as no one messes with it. Anticipation. There it goes. The second the crystal hit, this whole flask starts crystallizing out. Um, in just a couple of minutes, this flask basically sets entirely solid. Now the liquid that's still left is saturated, but all of the excess solid has come out in one massive kaboom. I just went up to the organic lab. Uh, we have some solutions that are crystallizing from yesterday. And um, only one out of the batch had crystallized. And I kind of took them and did this to them. And so far, all four of them now have nice batches of crystals. So, you know, when you hit the uh, super saturation point, almost anything will cause it to uh, deposit crystals. Kind of neat. Any questions? Um, another neat thing about this is that when this happens, this flask gets very, very hot. Very hot. Lots of energy is evolved. Um, this is one strategy for storing something like solar energy. You heat up a solution, when the sun shines, it gets super saturated. Then when the sun goes down and you're cold, you induce crystallization and you get all your energy back. Kind of neat. Is that solution the water and the uh, hydrogen chloride? What, what is the solution before you uh, put th the this is, in there? Uh, this was sodium acetate. That's just sodium a salt. Acetate. Okay. Sodium acetate dissolved in water but it's super saturated. It's more in there than it should be. That's why it crystallizes. Right. It just great? comes out like mm -hmm. man. All right. When we talk about solubility, there's a very useful rule of thumb, and that is like dissolves like. Water is a polar compound. We just saw that. And because it's polar, it will dissolve things that are polar. Either things that are ionic, or things that have polar covalent bonds. <clears throat> this is alcohol, ethanol. As an OH group, just like water, that makes it polar. And the two are completely miscible. You can mix as much alcohol as you want with water. It's just fine. It really is nice and soluble. Nice little martini here. 
This is oil and water. Oil is very nonpolar. That is, it does not have molecular dipoles. Because of that, and water is very polar, this just plain doesn't dissolve. So this is the difference between something, um, water is a polar solvent dissolving um, a polar compound or an ionic compound, and this is an organic compound, if you will, Nonpolar does not dissolve or dissolves very slightly. Any questions? Now, we kind of measured some of this stuff in lab on Monday. We looked at electrolytes and non electrolytes. The basic difference is. Compound which dissolves in something like water will form ions. We saw the sodium and the chloride anions, all surrounded by water, right? <clears throat> this allows that solution to conduct electricity, and that's called an electrolyte. If we have something like sucrose or alcohol, Alcohol dissolves in water because it's polar, but it doesn't form ions. Therefore, it does not conduct electricity, and it's a non-electrolyte. Now, after your lab, there's a very simple bottom line. If you're going to form ions, you're going to have good conductivity, if you do not form ions, you're not. Sodium chloride forms ions. We saw them. It's an electrolyte. Sugar, lots of polar covalent bonds. It dissolves in water, but does not form ions. It's a non-electrolyte. So that's the bottom line on the lab. If you get ions, it conducts electricity. If you don't, it does not. Any questions? All right. The fact that water has bent geometry, has positive ends down here, negative end up top, means that water can interact with things that are polar, but it can also interact with itself. And what it's going to form with itself is called a hydrogen bond. Hydrogen bond, very simple. We're just going to take this water molecule, put another one next to it. Now they're going to line up so the negative end is bonding here with this hydrogen, which is the positive end. Hence the name hydrogen bond. Now, we can do this again, can't we? We have another hydrogen here. There's one hydrogen bond, there's two. We also have an oxygen sitting up here. There can be a hydrogen bond acceptor to another molecule. And so here we have one, two, three hydrogen bonds. Now, hydrogen bonds are fairly weak. Oh, there may be 20%, maybe 10% of the actual bond strength of an OH bond. But if you get a lot of them, it makes a big, big difference. Here I have a water, and I've just put four around it, hydrogen bonding. Obviously, each of these guys can also hydrogen bond to their neighbors, and to their neighbors, and to their neighbors. 
This is a calculation of a clump of water. And what I want you to look at here, this is well, at the end of the calculation. The hydrogen should be um, semi-spherical, right? Down here, look at this. This oxygen has eaten half this hydrogen, hasn't it? It's, and so is this guy, and this guy, and this guy, and this guy. Now this overall structure changes 10 to the 6 times per second. So it's very dynamic. But there's always this huge hydrogen bonded complex, and again, that's what makes water so special. Water can dissolve things because it's polar, and it can form these nice hydrogen-bonded complexes. Now, you've probably heard of hydrogen bonds um, in biology. They probably didn't explain what they were, but this is the notion of base pairing. These are two DNA bases, AT, here we have an NH and an oxygen. The way these things pair up is because they form hydrogen bonded pairs. Up top, this hydrogen can interact with this oxygen. We have one hydrogen bond. Here we have a nitrogen and a hydrogen. These can form a hydrogen bond. And here's another oxygen, another hydrogen, and they form a hydrogen bond. This is how one DNA base recognizes its mate. It's how they know to go together. When you have a strand of DNA, something like this, what you really have are these bases, like here, here's the NH, the O, an N, NH, O, NH, etc. All of these line up in a hydrogen bond. This hydrogen bonding is what makes one particular strand line up exactly with this complement strand. Simple hydrogen bonding. Now one thing that they don't tell you if you look at the structure here, we have polyphosphate on the outside, um, and all these guys are on the inside. Um, actually, it looks something like this. Here's our polyphosphates on the outside, here's our double helix, and here's all our hydrogen bonded pairs in the middle. The only reason that this works is that when this stuff wraps up, it squeezes all the water out. Water is so phenomenal at hydrogen bonding that once the DNA opens up, it has no interest whatsoever in bonding with itself or anybody else because they're all busy hydrogen bonding with water. One of the key things about doing replication is you have to remove the water. That's why it's energy requiring to do replication. Water is just phenomenal. Hydrogen bonding, dissolving, polar stuff, it's amazing. The most amazing solvent on the planet. Any questions? All right. Well, let's go from water, solutions, hydrogen bonding, and stuff. And let's address the gas laws. These are going to be called the ideal gas laws. Ideal gas laws because they actually differ slightly from real gas laws. Uh, if you have real gases, they will deviate slightly from your calculations but only at very high pressures and concentrations and stuff like that. For a nice dilute gas like air, um, the ideal gas law describes the real world 
very, very nicely. Let's just review a little bit. Physical properties. Remember, something like water can exist in three phases. We have a solid phase, that's our ice. We have liquid water, and of course we have water vapor in equilibrium with everything else. Way back in chapter one, we talked about the three different phases and how they differ. We said that solids have defined shapes, defined volumes. It's a lump. We said that liquids have defined volume, but the shape is variable. It'll take on whatever shape your container is. And finally, we said gases have neither defined shape nor volume, and they just totally fill whatever container you put them in. Now, of course, here we're going to talk about gases, which means that we need to talk a little bit about the kinetic molecular theory. And the kinetic molecular theory basically tells us why we have solids, liquids, and gases. <clears throat> Every particle in existence has an attraction to every other particle. Like hydrogen bonding, it's an attractive force. Every particle has an attraction for everything else. <clears throat> the stronger it is, um, the, the tighter these particles are held together. Think about a lump of magnets. And here the attractive force is simply the magnetic force holding these things together in a lump. So let's start off with solids. With a solid. Here we have lots of solid particles. They have an inherent attraction for each other. But they don't have enough inherent energy to break away from each other. So they're frustrated. They just kind of sit in a lump and they shake. Okay, they're frustrated. Now if we put more energy into the system, what happens is we form a liquid. In a liquid, we put enough energy in that these particles can now move relative to each other, but they can't get away. They're still stuck next to somebody, but at least they can move around the room. Finally, if we put in enough energy so that we overcome all of the uh, attractive forces, that's when we wind up with a gas. Here we have totally broken all of the attractive forces, and these guys just fly around madly until they hit each other or they hit the walls of the container. Again, we're going to talk about gases. Things that I want you to remember about this little picture, they're pretty far apart, aren't they? They're moving like mad, and they keep going in a straight line until they hit each other or they hit the wall. Depending upon how much energy we put into something, we have a solid, a liquid, or a gas. All right, then the gas phase. A gas has an indefinite shape, takes the shape of its container. Why is that? Because they keep going in a straight line until they hit the wall or each other. It can expand and compress. Why is that? Because there's a lot of space in between these little particles now. So you can squeeze them closer together. You can let them go further apart expand and compress. 
And finally, because they're going so fast, and there's so many of them, it's going to be totally uniform. Any sample you grab is going to be identical to every other sample. All right. I've said several times that these guys fly around until they hit the wall or each other or whatever. This is actually a really neat little movie. This is a calculation. I took a movie of the output from it, but it's a calculation. Uh, there are 500 little gas particles in here. And what this thing does is every time they hit this movable bar at the top, um, depending upon how fast this individual particle is going, it'll push it up a little bit. If nobody hits it for a second, it drops a little bit, kind of goes up and down and up and down. This is gas pressure. Simply, gas pressure is these little gas particles lying about and hitting something. When they do, they exert pressure. They transfer energy, and that's gas pressure. Now, gas pressure of the atmosphere, the stuff that we're living under, is about 14.7 pounds per square inch. So think about an inch, square inch, like this. There's 15 pounds of gas pressure pushing on that. If we weren't full of gas, pushing back with the same force, we'd be squished to nothing. Okay, so that's amazing. Gas pressure, well you can measure it several ways. <clears throat> uh, this is the classic thing, this is a barometer. Um, and it will tell you when it's going to rain, when it's not going to rain, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, the, the units on this oh, can be, well, really strange. Um, don't talk about millibars on TV, uh, talk about inches, whatever. But basically, uh, there's a little disc in here, and it feels the pressure of the atmosphere. And that moves on a little needle. When you have a rainstorm, the pressure drops. When it's a nice day outside, the pressure tends to be higher. This is a recording device. Again, here's our little bellows unit that measures the pressure, drives a pin, makes a line. This is something you use in the lab. It's called a manometer. Um, you'll hook it to a vacuum system suck it down so these mercury things become more or less even. You can measure the pressure as the difference between the two mercury lines. And finally, this is my favorite. It's a little glass globe. Now, I grew up in Florida. I grew up a long time ago in Florida, back before there were satellites or anything like that. And there are hurricanes in Florida. And by gosh, you never knew when one was going to come. You had no clue. So you had one of these things. This is sealed, filled with water, little arm coming out. You can barely see that part, but little arm coming out. If the pressure outside starts to drop really low, that means a big storm is coming. What happens is water squirts up here and out the top. If you look at your little thing and you say, oh my goodness, there's water squirting out, that means you better take cover <laughs> because that's a beautiful hurricane because there's something coming. Now, isn't the hurricane's beautiful? Oh yeah, I mean, look at that, it's gorgeous. <laughs> it's gorgeous. So, the barometer that we use in chemistry is it nearly as exciting? It looks something like this. This is a tube, just a glass tube, sealed at one end, open at the other. This is filled with mercury. 
and in our little bucket here at the bottom, we also have mercury. Now, back in the old days before mercury was a neurotoxin, we used to all make these in lab. And what you would do is you would take your glass tube, pour mercury down it, then you would take, put your finger over it, stick it down in the tub of mercury, let your finger go. The weight of the mercury will drop, pulling a vacuum, until air pressure going this way equals the air pressure in the vacuum here. And then it stops. The height of this, from the level of your mercury to this point, is the atmospheric pressure. Now, <clears throat> at sea level, zero degrees centigrade, this height is exactly 760 millimeters of mercury. We will call that atmospheric pressure. Okay? Atmospheric pressure, 760 millimeters of mercury. When we talk about atmospheric pressure, we're going to be using units. One atmosphere, one ATM, is the same as 760 millimeters of mercury. So that's one atmosphere right there. Sometimes you will see millimeters of mercury written as TOR, T-O-R-R. -R. Again, millimeters and TOR are the same thing. Don't get confused. 760, one atmosphere. As we saw, we could also do this in PSI, 14.7 pounds per square inch. But forget this one. We never do that in science. Don't do pounds or inches. So the two units we're going to deal with are going to be atmospheres and millimeters. Now, this is important. Write this on your card for the next exam. A pressure in millimeters can be converted to atmospheres simply by dividing by 760. So if our height was 760, we divide by 760, that's one atmosphere, isn't it? Now if you're given a pressure in atmospheres, one atmosphere, you just do the opposite, you multiply by 760 to get millimeters. So it's a very simple conversion either multiply or divide by 760. We'll do a couple later on just to show you. Any questions? All right, well, the gas laws are going to be, are going to speak of the effect of things like pressure and temperature and number of holes on volume. So we're going to do these one at a time. This is our pressure volume relationship. Now this is what we're going to call Boyle's Law. What Boyle's Law says is the volume occupied by a fixed quantity of gas is inversely proportional to the pressure. <clears throat> what that says in English is, the greater the pressure, the smaller the volume. That kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Greater the pressure, the smaller the volume. Now let's work our way through this. This is a little device here. There's a pressure gauge. This is a sealed cylinder. This is a piston kind of floating on top of this gas, just like the one we saw in the animation. What we're going to do is put weights on this to 
to allow the gas to compress. So if we start off with a very small mass, well, not much happened in it <clears throat> because it's very small. But if we put a large mass on it, this will compress a lot, and we'll have a very small volume. So small mass, large volume, big mass, small volume. Now anvils and feathers are fun. But let's look at a real demonstration of this using the same apparatus. What I'm going to do is slowly increase the pressure on my piston here. I'm going to measure the pressure. And I'm going to plot volume and pressure here. As we start, we're pushing this down. Our volume decreases, it gets this way, and our pressure increases. Now, the first thing you should note is this is not linear, is it? Think about it. All these gas particles have an inherent volume themselves, don't they? So you can never push it to zero. That means that this line must go up very close to zero but it can never get there. That means this is non-linear. Now if we take the data from this and we plot them out, by gosh, it is non-linear. Turns out that mathematically this is hyperbolic. If you remember from introduction to hyperbolic equations. If you have a hyperbolic equation and you want to linearize it, very simply, all you have to do is plot a reciprocal plot. So this is volume versus 1 over pressure. And that's linear. All hyperbole will give a linear plot as a reciprocal. All right, that means if we want to write an equation describing this, we can simply say volume. This little sign there looks like an alpha. It's actually called a proportionality sign. The volume is proportional, directly proportional, to 1 over p. Volume, directly proportional to 1 over p. Now, one trick that you need to remember here, and we're going to use it over and over, whenever you have a proportionality sign, instead of saying volume is proportional to 1 over p, we can make this an equality. We can make it equal to something. And the way we do that is simply replace proportionality with equal sign and a constant. Turns out that the constant here is actually the slope of this line, but you don't care about that. <clears throat> Again, we have simply replaced proportionality with equal k. Okay, any questions on the little bit of magic math there? Let's take this and apply it to our two situations. Once again, proportionality can always be replaced by an equal sign and a constant. All right, so let's look at our two situations. <clears throat> if we take what we just wrote here, V equals K, 1 over P. I can rearrange this to make it easier because I don't like writing things in fractions. I can simply say that if 
I multiply both sides by P, PV is equal to K. So I multiply this by P, this by P, this guy disappear, PV equals K. Now for our first situation, we had a very small mass. We will call this P1, the pressure exerted by our feather. And this resulting volume we'll call V1. So that's our initial state, P1 and V1. Over here, we had a large mass. So our pressure was greater, see the little arrow, and our volume was less. But again, P2, V2 is still equal to a constant. Now, this is the same gas. This is the same apparatus. That means that this constant is the same as this constant. So over here, P1, V1 equals a constant. Over here, P2, V2 is equal to the same constant. Now if they're both equal to the same constant, that means you can write P1, V1, that's this guy, must equal P2, V2. This is what we will call Boyle's Law. This is Boyle, Robert Boyle, a uh, pretentious looking guy. Doesn't look particularly nice. But this is his law. P1, V1 equals P2, V2. Now make sure you understand what we've done here. We measure pressure and volume with one particular pressure, pressure volume with another one. This, this is different somehow. This product must equal this one. Now why is that important? That simply is because if we have a system and we make a change, if we know three of these things, we can solve for the unknown. Let's see how that works. We have 12 and a half liters of gas. Our pressure is 0.82 atmospheres. We're going to change our pressure to 1.32 atmospheres. What's our final volume? Now think about what's happening here. We have something that's sitting here is happy has a given pressure and volume. We're going to increase the pressure, squeeze it down. What is our final volume? This is a classic Boyle's Law problem. <clears throat> P1, V1, P2, V2. All we have to do is solve this for V2, that's our final volume in terms of these guys. Do you multiply? Nope, let's just do this. Here's Boyle's Law, P1, V1, P2, V2. What we're trying to find here is V2, right? Trying to find this. So we need to solve this algebraically for V2. To do that, we're simply going to divide both sides by P2. It'll disappear from this side, show up here, and we're going to get V2, P1, V1, divided by our P2. Make sure you can do this simple algebra. Okay, that was a prerequisite for taking this. You have to do simple algebra. V2 is P1, V1, 
over P2. All right, once we have this, all we have to do is substitute. P1 is what? 0.82. P1, 12.5. And P2, this guy, 1.32. Now you want to pull out your handy dandy calculators. And all you have to do is take 0.82 times 12.5 divided by 1.32. Anybody done it yet? Atmospheres cancel. You're left only with liters. 7.8 liters. If you haven't done this yet on your calculator, do it. And make sure that this works. All you do is take 0.82, multiply by 12.5, divide by 1.32, and you should get 7.8. Any question? All right, let me do one more here. Here I have 150 milliliters of gas. <clears throat> Doesn't matter what it is. And my pressure I put here in milliliters of mercury, 35.3. We're going to decrease the volume to 50 mil. So again, we're squeezing it down. What is our final pressure? Now we're solving for P2. So you start off with P1, V1, P2, V2. And we simply solve for P2. It should be P1, V1 divided by V2. So let's move it over here. Now you substitute in P1, our initial pressure, 35 millimeters. V1, 150 milliliters. V2, 50 milliliters. Milliliters are going to cancel, aren't they? So the calculation you feed to your little box there, 35.3 times 150 divided by 50, 106. Again, the units of pressure here are millimeters. Any question? Now, I know that everybody's sitting back wondering to themselves, this is so much fun. I hope there's a tutorial. <laughs> well, of course there's a tutorial. The Boyle's Law tutorial. <clears throat> now, some of the questions in this tutorial might seem a little odd as you read them. Um, if you read it and it's, it's just seems odd to you, click the uh, your problem button and try another one, okay? Because there are many variations that will come up. Um, what you're looking for is five that you can do and get right, all right? So here's one. We have an initial pressure, that's P1, five atmospheres. We have 5,050 milliliters. We change our volume to 5.62 liters. What's our final pressure? Now the way to do this stuff, the way to do these that makes it work, is you want to do a list, a list of what you've got. 
So here we know P1, V1, and V2. So I would start the problem this way. P1 is 5.05 atmospheres. V1, 5,050 milliliters. We don't know what P2 is. Our second volume is given in liters. These units have to match. They have to match. We could change this guy to liters, or we could change this to milliliters. Doesn't matter, but they have to match. So, 5.6 liters, multiplied by 1,000, 1,000 mils per liter. We're dealing with 5620 milliliters. All right, so you set this up. <clears throat> you know all your values, and you're happy with it. Next, remember, P1, V1, P2, V2. And we're solving for P2. We'll use simple algebra, P1, V1 over V2. And then 5, um, 45, that's right there. You don't round it off to 5? Or just no, leave it like that? No, you just kind of, well, we'll see, we'll see. <clears throat> yeah, get around this. Um, so here is our P1, 5.05, uh, V1, 5,050 mils. Our V2, 5620 mils, do our calculation, round it off, 4.54. 4. Now, if you hadn't rounded this off, if you entered the whole number, well, you'd be wrong. But the program is forgiving enough that it says, OK, close enough. So try to round it off like you're supposed to. But again, there's enough slot built in it, um, so it will work for you. Let's do one more here. Go ahead, look at these, come up with your list of P1, V1, P2, V2. Our initial pressure as P1 is 2350. Our initial volume is 8520. We are going to 5.6 atmospheres. And we want to know the volume in liters. Okay, we can do that. Here's our list. <clears throat> we have 2350 millimeters of mercury. V1 listed here at 8520. I just converted that to liters because we want liters in our answer. Makes sense. Divide by 1,000. But this guy, 5.6 atmospheres. And we need it in millimeters. How do we do that? We simply multiply 5.6 by 760. Remember, 760 is our magic number. Either multiply or divide to go back and forth. And we're trying to find V2. All right, we're looking for V2. We solve for it, P1, V1 over P2. Do our substitution, do our multiplication and division, and we get 3.58 liters.
Any questions? Once again, um, sometimes you have to fish around on the Boyle's Law tutorial to find problems that aren't too strange, but there will come up and you can easily get your five. All right, let's do temperature volume. We did pressure volume, let's do temperature volume. And for this, we're going to use a balloon. What we're going to do is take a jug of liquid nitrogen. Liquid nitrogen is minus 196 degrees centigrade. Very cold, very dangerous stuff. Um, it will just freeze and burn your skin, your thumb will fall off, stuff like that. Don't want to play with it. <clears throat> We're going to dump that on this balloon. What you're going to see, hopefully, is as the air in the balloon here is cooled by our liquid nitrogen, the volume decreases. Now as liquid nitrogen all evaporates, the balloon now warms once again and will very soon return to its former glory. So our observation here is, as the temperature is decreased, the volume decreases. As the temperature increases, the volume increases. This is a simple linear relationship. Temperature increases, volume increases. A simple linear relationship. Now playing with balloons and liquid nitrogen is really fun. It is. But Chemists like to do plots and things like that. They aren't nearly so much fun. But let's do a plot. Here I'm going to take and measure the volume of a gas, the same gas, as I change the temperature. OK? I'm going to do different temperatures, measure my volume, and plot it out. I'm going to measure my gas in terms of the number of moles. Number of moles, just a unit, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. We're going to start off here with 0.25 moles of this gas. Could be any gas. As we cool it, the volume decreases. Now that's what we thought. That's good. Makes us feel good. So let's do it again. Now with half a mole. Yeah, still works. Let's do it again. 0.75 moles. You know, this is working really well. As we lower our temperature, the volume decreases. But, look at this. These guys all look like they're heading somewhere, don't they? They all look like they're heading for the same spot. In fact, if you take these lines and you extrapolate them, they all hit at exactly the same spot. This is minus 273.15 degrees centigrade. Now, what in the world is that number? We've all heard of it. What is it? Zero. That is absolute zero. That's what absolute zero is. Theoretically, at absolute zero, remember how our solid was just shaking? At absolute zero, you remove all of the energy, and it just sits there now. You actually can't get there. You can get darn close, but you can't quite get there. Things always want to move. 
This sets about a new scale. If this is absolute zero, then we define this is zero, and we go on. This is called the Kelvin scale, with a K. The Kelvin scale. Anytime you do a gas law problem involving temperature, it has to start at absolute zero, and you have to use Kelvin. All right. Let's go back and let's look at what we've seen in terms of an equation. We said that volume and temperature were directly proportional. As we lowered the temperature, the volume dropped, right? That's what we said. Think of our balloon. Let's take our proportionality and convert it to a KT. We can do that. Mathematically, that's fine. Now, what I'm going to do here is solve for K. That means I'm going to have a T on this side, and K is going to be V over T. Now, let's pretend that we measure volume at some temperature. We'll call that V1 and T1. Here we go. And then let's say we change our temperature. So we're now at V to our T2. We can also write V2 over T2 is going to be equal to K. Same gas, same system. That means that this K and this K are the same. Therefore, if these two are the same, we can write this as our equation. V1, T1, V2, T2. This is Charles's law. Charles, what's his last name? This is Charles's law. This is uh, Charles. Um, actually, to me, he looks so much friendlier than Boyle did. You know, he's a kind of guy who's a little fluffy, got uh, real hair, etc. Um, looks like a much nicer guy. In fact, if I look at this picture, I don't know if anybody still knows who Barry Manilow is, but sure looks a whole lot like Barry Manilow. He sure do. Any questions? B1 over T1, B2 over T2, Charles's Law. Now remember I said we have to use Kelvin. We know that water freezes at zero degrees centigrade, and it boils at 100. In Kelvin, water freezes at 273, and boils at 373. Now these numbers are different, aren't they? But there's 100 units in between both of them. So the size of the degree is the same. All you have to do to convert centigrade to Kelvin is simply add 273. Remember, they'll always differ by 273. Centigrade will always be smaller than Kelvin. These are test questions we're talking about here, so make sure you know this. Okay? Let's do a couple quick problems. If I tell you something is a thousand centigrade or minus 150 or 100, quickly give me the Kelvin temperatures. What do you have to remember? 
centigrade plus 273 is Kelvin. Centigrade is always the small guy. Centigrade plus 273 is Kelvin. We typically forget the 0.15. So if we're at 1,000 centigrade, that's 1273 Kelvin. Now here we're at minus 150. We're going to add 273 to it, and that gives us 123. Where are you getting the 2 from? Um, it's just rounding the 0.15 oh, okay. If we're at 100 boiling point of water, we're going to be at 373 Kelvin. Remember, you always have to use Kelvin when you're dealing with gases. So you're either going to have to add or subtract 273. No problem. 50 mils of a gas, and we're at 26.4 centigrade. We're going to heat it up until our volume is 62.4. What's our final temperature? You look at this and you say, Charles and Law, we know V1, T1, and we know V2. What we're looking for here is simply T1. So you recognize it as Charles and Law. What do you do? Well, you write Charles and Law. Now we're looking here for T2. So we have to do a little bit of algebra, don't we? Yeah. Have to multiply both sides by T2, <clears throat> and then divide by V2. Make sure you can do this simple algebra. And you should get T2 equal to V2 T1 over V1. Make sure you can do that. Now all we have to do is our substitution, right? V2, 62. T1, 26. Oops. 26 is centigrade. So you have to add 273 to it, don't we? Mm -hmm. And finally, V1 is 50 mils. 26.4 plus 273 is darn near 300 Kelvin. All right, take these guys, shove them into your equation here. Here is V2. Here's T1, and here is V1. On your magic calculator, you type in 62.4 times 299.6 divided by 50. Our volume cancels. We're left only with Kelvin. That's way too many numbers. Let's round it because we're only dealing with three numbers here. 374. If by some odd chance somebody asked you what 374 Kelvin was in centigrade, what would you do? You would subtract 273. And that would be 101 centigrade. Now I know what you're thinking. Yes, there is a tutorial. We have an initial volume and temperature. Here's our volume of 11,000 mils. 
Our temperature is 106 centigrade. We have to convert that to Kelvin, don't we? It has to be Kelvin. We're going to change our volume to 7.66 liters. So we need to do liters and milliliters. Have to fix that. And we're looking for our final temperature. That's T2. So just like we did with oil, start off with the scorecard. Here's our V1. V2, I multiplied by a thousand to get milliliters. <clears throat> Our temperature was given as centigrade. I added 273 to get Kelvin. And I'm looking for T2. I will pause for a second while you solve the algebra. Remember, it's D1 over uh, T1, V2 over T2. Solve for T2. Make sure you can do this. T2 is, I can barely read it, V2, o, V2, T1 over V1. Once you get to the equation, all you have to do is shove the numbers in, feed it to your calculator. You're going to do 77 or 7660 times 379 divided by 11,000, and you should get 264. Remember, only enter numbers, no kilowatts or centigrades or whatever. Any questions? All right, well, we did pressure volume. We did temperature volume. We're going to do one more. Well, we're going to go back to the plot we made for Charles. Remember this guy? Now I said that I was using different numbers of moles, wasn't I? So if we set out at some constant temperature and just varied the number of moles, what happens? Well, it's actually very simple. It's very intuitive. We add more gas, the volume goes up, right? That makes sense. You add more gas, the volume goes up. Let's take this group, some constant temperature, and simply plot them. When we do that, we get the mole-volume relationship. Volume versus number of moles. Again, intuitively, we know the answer. You add more gas, the volume goes up. Simple as it can be. This is what is known as Avogadro's Law. As the number of moles goes up, the volume increases. Simple, direct proportion. All right, let's do scorekeeping here. What do we know so far about gas laws? We know Boyle told us volume was proportional to 1 over P. Bigger the pressure, smaller the volume. We know that Charles told us volume and temperature were directly proportional. Higher the temperature, bigger the volume. And our friend Avogadro just told us, as we had more gas, that's more moles, our volume goes up directly. 
Now think about it. If volume is proportional to 1 over Pt and n, can't we just combine this all into one equation? Well, of course we can. Volume must be proportional to nt over p. All we did is combine these things, nt and again 1 over p. Now, Every time we see this little proportionality sign, what do we do? We get rid of it, right? How do we get rid of it? We put in an equal sign and a constant. Except, I'm tired of using K. Aren't you tired of Ks? I'm tired of Ks. Instead of using K, I'm going to use something else. How about R? And I'm going to call my R the universal gas constant. So instead of K, I simply write R. OK. That's fine. But let's take this equation and fiddle with it just one last time. What if I multiply both sides by P? So I'm bringing the P up here, right? On this side, I will have PV over here. I'll have an R and an NT. And it would look something like this. PV equals NRT. Whoa, that's got a nice sound to it, doesn't it? That does. That's got a nice PV equals NRT. Holy cacoli. This is the ideal gas law. Before you go to bed, put your head on the pillow and say to yourself, oh, PV equals NRT. This is the universal gas law. It even like rhymes with itself. PV equals NRT. Now this would be useful if we knew what this constant was, wouldn't it? Now remember, we don't know what R is yet. But our friend Avogadro told us how to do this. Remember back when we were talking about moles? Avogadro said that if you have gas at 273 Kelvin, that's room temp, 25 degrees. Although this, yeah, no, this is zero degrees, sorry. One atmosphere, that one mole of any gas, any gas, doesn't matter what it is, any gas will have a volume of 22.4 liters. So we have one mole, 273, and 22.4. One mole, only thing we don't know in this equation is R. So let's solve for R. Plug in. Pressure is 1. Volume is 22.4. In, one mole. And our temperature, 273. Now, what do I do next? We cancel everything, right? Nothing cancels. Nothing cancels. So we just have to do our math. 22.4 divided by 273 gives us 0.082 with units of liter atmosphere per mole per Kelvin. Now, you know what? I can't remember that either. I can't, for the life of me. I've done this 40 years. I can never remember this. So if you ever need it on an exam or a quiz or whatever, it's going to be there. OK? 0.082 liter atmosphere 
per mole per kelvin. All right, so we know what R is. That's good. <clears throat> Let's take this one step further from the ideal gas law to what we're going to call the combined gas law. Now, we're not going to do this in this course, but I'm going to show it to you, and then you can forget it if you want. I got the O eight two O. Okay. But I didn't. I got a O seven two. I didn't have. Oh well, uh, probably just a rounding thing. They, I probably rounded different. It's okay. Close enough. All right. <clears throat> Let's play our game here. R is our constant, right? So what if we have a sample of gas at one temperature, one volume, one pressure or whatever. <clears throat> Once again, R is a constant, one set of conditions, second set of conditions, two R's are going to be the same. Therefore, our combined gas law would look like this. Now, this means we have two ways to do ideal gas laws. A single state problem, that is, you know three things about a gas. You know its volume, temperature, number of moles, and you're trying to solve for whatever's missing. Okay? You know three things, and you're solving for the fourth. That's a single state problem. A two state problem. You're starting off with one set of conditions, and you're changing it. Once again, <clears throat> the tutorial for this guy is out there. You can do it if you want. It's just lots of numbers to deal with. But as far as the rest of the course goes, we're just doing PV equals NRT. So let's do a simple PV equals NRT problem. Here I'm looking for the number of moles. We have 18.6 liters. We're at 293 Kelvin. And our pressure is 2.35 atmospheres. This is a single state problem. We're looking for N. Here's our equation. We know everything except N. So let's take this equation, rearrange it. We're looking for PV over RT. So what you do is basically this. You look up top. What's our pressure? 2.35. What's our volume? 18.6. What's R? Well, you look back on the previous slide. 0 0.0802 something or other. No, 0.0821. I told you I can't remember it. <laughs> and our units are liter atmosphere per mole per Kelvin. And finally, what's our temperature? 293. It's in Kelvin, so we're good. 293 Kelvin. Now, you can always tell if you set it up right. Because things will cancel. Here we have atmospheres, top and bottom. Here we have liters, top and bottom. 
Here we have Kelvin and per Kelvin. Only thing left is per mole in the denominator, so it's going to come up. How do you do the problem? You can do it while I talk. 2.35 times 18.6 divided by 0.821 divided by 293 equals... And what have you? 1.81. Yes. Any questions? Yeah. And of course, of course, of course, there is a tutorial. <clears throat> so this is, I forget what it's called, but it's the ideal gas laws or something like that. And it looks like this. Now these are all PV equals NRT problems. Okay? You might have to swap units and stuff like that, but they're all PV equals NRT. Start off, as always, make a list. We have volume, moles, and temperature. There's our volume, there's our moles, there's our temp. What's the pressure in atmospheres? Don't know the pressure, here's our volume, here's our moles, here's our temp. Um, one thing you have to remember here is that pressure always has to be atmospheres, volume always has to be liters, of course temperature always has to be Kelvin. That's because of the units of R. All right, we're simply plugging in P equals NRT, and we're solving for P. NRT over V is what we want. N, 0 0.39, 0 0.396, R, 0 0.082 something or other. T, 291.9, V, 5.122, do it, 1.86 atmospheres is our correct answer. I don't even remember what, the R is what? Um, R is, again, it'll tell you what R is, but it's uh, 0 0.0821. And what Liter atmosphere per degree per something. So R always is point oh eight. It's always point oh eight. Okay. So two one with units. All right, I'm going to put one more up here. Oh, sometimes this thing will ask you. You do all of this, and it ask you for the pressure or something in millimeters. How would we do that? 1.86 times 760. Remember, 760 is your magic number. So this would be the same as 1408 millimeters. All right, let's do one more here. One point five five nine atmospheres, eighty three fifty seven milliliters, and point seven oh six moles. What's our temperature? Remember, it has to be liters. Okay, it has to be liters. So we're going to have to change that to liters. That's all. Eighty-three fifty-seven mils is eight point three five seven liters. We have point oh point seven oh six moles, one point five five nine atmospheres, and we're looking for our temperature. So take P equals in our T and solve for T.
should get T is PV over NR. So you simply feed your numbers in here. P is 1.559. Volume is 8.357. In 0.706. R 0.0821. Feed it to your magic calculator. You should get 225 Kelvin. All right, after we finish a new concept, I always like to look at old exam questions so that you have an idea of what you might expect someday. <clears throat> so let's look at one. Under conditions of fixed temp and amount of gas, Boyle's law requires what? Basically, which of these properly represents Boyle's law? Well, all of them do. All of them do. Let's think about that. P1, V1, P2, V2. We all know that. That's boil law. Okay. Remember how we got to Boyle's law? We said that pressure times volume was a constant, right? So this is where we started. That's always true, too. So those two are right. And how about this guy? <clears throat> is this equation the same as this one? Well, if we multiply both sides by V1, we get V1, P1. We multiply both sides by P2, we get V2, P2. Oops, yep, they're exactly the same. Now, years ago, oh, 30 years ago, I was writing an exam, and I wanted to put a really easy question on so everybody was sure to get it. They can feel better. And so I put this on. And darn near everybody in the class missed it. <laughs> and every time I've written a Boyle's Law question or exam since, I put either this or a derivative of it on the exam. So I can assure you, you will see something that looks very much like this. And now actually I had so much fun doing this one that I also did Charles. Which of these accurately reflects Charles' law? No? This is what we have written for Charles' law, right? So the question is, which of these is equal to this? Our first one, T1, V1, T2, V2. That's not right. That's Boyle's law, except with T's and V's, right?
PV was a constant, but not TV. Remember we wound up with V over T was a constant? That's wrong. Now, I dare you to take this equation and solve it any way you can to make it into this. Doesn't work. There is no way you can, um, we bring, well, there's no way we can get V1, and uh, these guys will always wind up with T2 on top here instead of T1. Well, this guy doesn't work either. So the magic answer is a dreaded none of the above. And again, I guarantee you, you will see something darn near like, now I'll change it, you know, they, this is so much fun changing all these things. But make sure you can do this simple algebra and convert these equations back and forth. Here's a real problem. We have a pressure. Well, we have a pressure, we have a volume. We're going to reduce our volume until our pressure is 5. And what is our final volume? So this is a pressure volume problem. That's Boyle's law, right? All we have to do is take this. We're looking for the final volume as V2. So it should be P1, V1 over P2. Plug them in. <clears throat> P1 is one atmosphere. V1, 450. P2, five atmospheres. Atmospheres cancel. You should wind up with 90 milliliters as your answer. Here's another one that I can pretty much guarantee is going to be on an exam or some derivative of this. When comparing centigrade and Kelvin, what's true? One Kelvin is a larger change than one centigrade. No, remember we said they were exactly the same size. That's what makes it easy. Let's skip C. Only readings on centigrade scale can be directly converted to Fahrenheit. Well, that's stupid. All these are true. None of these are true. The one we skipped here, centigrade and Kelvin are never numerically equal. Why is that? Because centigrade plus 273 is Kelvin. And our last one. Methane is a gas. Doesn't matter what the gas is, remember, on the Dodro. Right? We have 35 liters of it at standard temperature and pressure. Now we haven't used that term. Standard temperature pressure is zero degrees. <clears throat> um, pressure is one atmosphere. It's standard. Okay? It's a standard. Um, and we have 35. We want to know how many moles. So we're looking for N. Now we could do PV equals NRT, couldn't we? Right? We're looking for N, we know PV, we know R, we know T. But, remember what Avogadro told us. If we had exactly one mole of methane, what would its volume be? 22.4. Right? 
Well, what volume do we have? 35. That's more than 22.4, so it's more than one mole, isn't it? How much more? 35 divided by 22.4. 1.56 moles. Always remember, one mole is always going to be 22.4, and this is a really, really simple way to figure out the number of moles. All right, let's wind up this way. <clears throat> We have done these tutorials so far. Last chapter, we did balancing. We did mole mass. We did mole mass. We did percent composition, and we did molarity. Today, we did Boyle, Charles, and the ideal gas law. <clears throat> I told you there was a combined gas law. This is the two state. If you want to try this one, please do. If you do it and you get it right, I will give you 10 points, not five, because it's a little bit more difficult. <clears throat> Next week is spring break, is that right? Yes! All right, so you guys have a very nice spring break. Um, and we will do Another chapter, chapter seven, right? We will do chapter seven when we get back. Do we have a test on chapter six? Um, uh, there'll be a test on a bunch. Uh, I'm not sure what. Okay. Ah. Do you remember the lab that we did, number five, I think?